The Money Show. Small business. Pavlo Vatidis is a small business expert. He is the founder of Auric Business Accelerator. He is a regular contributor to The Money Show, and it's always good to have him on on a Thursday night. How do you you think about your business? Uh, it really helps it develop, I suppose, Pavlo. Um, and it's kind of means that you've got to take time to think about your business. The Small Business Focus brought to you by Productivity SA, providing solutions for businesses in distress. Uh, before you get to distress, um, uh, really thinking about the business matters. It matters hugely. It matters hugely. In fact, Bruce, if you, think, if you think the way you look at the world is very typically how the world shapes out for you. That's what the world becomes. And, you, you know, they're, they're two well-known, uh, let's call it, um, uh, uh, positions around this or expressions around it. The first is to do with cognitive dissonance, and the other then is to do with a confirmation bias. And both of them more or less say that the attitude you hold towards something leads you through a pattern of unconscious behavior, something that you're not necessarily aware of, that seeks to constantly confirm that attitude and prevents new thoughts, new ideas entering into your mindset. And it's been interesting that because it it happens with all of us and it happens with all of us in every sphere of life. I've been following very, very closely uh, the debates and arguments from intelligent, smart people on both sides of the camp around the COVID vaccines. And whenever I speak to equally smart people, I say, where do you get your information from? And they point me to various sources, all sources who favor vaccines and they favor vaccines. So the sources they seek are sources that favor vaccines. That's your confirmation bias. You you want to be told what you think. I mean, that's what you read, yeah. Completely, completely. And and the same reflects in a business. And I've got an example of two really interesting clients. And I think the reason that they're interesting is because they're so similar. They're both involved in, in the manufacturing industry. They've got very similar business metrics. One is a South African business. The other is a, a business located in the United States. They make furniture, they design furniture, and then they distribute furniture. They both employ around 80 people, more or less, and they sell through retailers as well as direct. Okay, so very, very similar models. And the furniture they make, Bruce, is furniture for your home. So lounge suites, armchairs, coffee tables, side tables, that type of stuff. Uh, They've got different designs. They've got their own designs. And they've been running more or less, the one business is about five years older than the other, but they've been more or less um, on a par for par basis, very, very similar. And the outcomes of the two are fantastically different. And when I really push hard to figure out why it is so, ultimately it always goes to how those two business owners who know not of each other, but how they see their business is affecting the outcome of their business. Uh, There is also, uh, I suppose, some people just are victims of circumstance. I mean, when you're deep in the doldrums, when you you owe your creditors a million rand and you just can't see your way clear, you can be as positive as you like. You can sing Kumbaya every morning, (laughs) breakfast, lunch, and supper. You can help old people across the road. You can do all kinds of things. It's not going to change the facts of the catastrophe that you find yourself in, I'm afraid. It doesn't. It doesn't. So so it's very interesting to understand in in these two businesses how both people started. Because they started from very different positions. And in many ways, where they started from informed how they chose or eventually landed up understanding their businesses. And I I don't want to give away names. So can I call them Jack and Jill, Bruce, just to to illustrate the point. So, So Jack, his business... He, he started his business uh, more or less at around 38 years of age. And before that, he had worked most of his life in corporate. And he'd worked in the corporate furniture industry, 
So he worked for a fairly big manufacturer that had uh, warehouses and was selling direct to public. And his role there was he started on the floor as a, um, the manufacturer. He worked the plant and the equipment. He worked in stores. He got a really comprehensive understanding of how you design furniture, how you buy all the bits, how you put them together, and how you dispatch them for, for sale um, into, into a warehouse environment. And he had great, great understanding of the different fabrics, which ones are durable, which ones are in vogue, which ones aren't. He could tell the difference, and I don't know if you can, because it's not so easy nowadays, between genuine leather and uh, imitation leather or fake leather, uh, because that product is equally good. It's got a very similar feel, et cetera, et cetera. He had a lot of knowledge. And he opted to, to exit corporate life and start his business with all those relationships, having been to many, many international trade shows, a big understanding of the supply chain. He knew exactly where to get what he needed, as he needed, how he needed at the right price. That's his backstory. That's where he started. Jill, on the other hand, well, she started uh, from the get-go. Uh, she started more or less at the age of 27. Uh, she was still living uh, in her parents' home, so she started out of the garage, per se. Um, and she did so under very different circumstances. She had to pay for uh, tuition, and she had to contribute to the household income. And she then designed furniture, she made it, and she sold it directly to public and through a few small boutique furniture stores. And over the last three years, she eventually got access into the bigger stores and some of the chain stores too. So very, very different backstories. And I'm going to give you the secret sauce <laughs> about how you understand how each of these individuals, given those backstories, see their business. I always ask two questions. The first question I ask is, what makes your business special in a highly competitive, overcrowded space? What makes it special? And then the second question I ask is, over the years and over the path you've traveled, what challenges did you face and what did you do to overcome them? So it was really interesting because... I'm going to give you the answer to both questions, and you tell me which one is Jack and which one is Jill. So the first question, what makes your business special? And the one business owner said, hey, listen, you know what? It's all about the materials and the fabrics, and it's all about how you design the chassis. In other words, the underlying infrastructure that creates the couch or creates the armchair, because that determines how much fabric you use, it determines what you can do with the fabric to give it a design and a look and a feel. The next thing he said is it really matters about how you manufacture the product. If you've got an inefficient factory floor, you know, the cost tries, rework rises, there are all sorts of issues. And this business owner proceeded to show me uh, in, in the factory some of the new plant and equipment. And there were some really cool equipment, CAD systems, which are computer-aided design systems to help design the furniture, and they interlinked and integrated directly into CNC lathes, which are computer-aided lathes to cut out the fabrics and the patterns that would then fall over the chassis that created the furniture. The other business owner turned around and said what made them and their business special were the sales representatives. And they had this team of real reps, the old-fashioned rep, that individual who pounds the pavement, has samples of fabrics, has samples of, and, and catalogs of different designs, who go and visit these retail stores and try and compel and convince the shop owner to carry some of their stock. And I said, well, how are they special? And the business owner said to me, well, you know, they have a big say on how we manufacture, what we manufacture, what fabrics to use, what designs we should use. And that was their definition. The second question is on challenges. So the one said, hey, listen, you know, when I face challenges, I reshape my supply chain. I find different materials. 
I find better pricing or I find better quality, depending on what the problem is. <laughs> I've got the benefit of being able to do some quick designs and tap it right into the factory floor, onto the lathes, and I will create that better product in order to overcome the challenges posed by the other products. The other one turned around and said, well, let me show you how I do it. And this business owner, Bruce, took me on a tour and insisted that I visit this business owner on a Saturday. I said, why Saturday? It's retail day. And they took me through to four of their clients. They didn't introduce me to the clients, but they said, look, look at what that customer's doing on that piece of furniture. Look how they're testing it. Look how they're feeling it. Look how they are engaging with it. Look at their reaction when they look at the price. Look at who they bring in order to make the purchase decision with. The husband, the wife, the kids, the mom, the dad, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, whoever it may be. And it was a fascinating experience. So now my question to you <laughs> is Test time, yes. which one is struggling and which one isn't? Now, I want to say the first one is doing better than the second one because they're really focusing on the nuts and bolts of their business. They really are focusing on their process. They're focusing on their manufacture. <laughs> and they're, they're really good. But I'm making an assumption that oh, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> a, couch, a couch is a couch is a couch. Um, and I'm going to quote Maya Angelou. It's it's not about how, no, no it's not, I'm going to misquote Maya Angelou. It's not about you know, where you sit that counts. It's how you feel when you're sitting there. Um, uh, and I, I wonder if Jill, um, who ostensibly is better at the softer skills, uh, which are actually the important skills, the representation, the selling, the feedback from the reps who are going to see the customers, the fact that she goes out to the shops and watches how people interact with her product gives her an intelligence that you're not going to get if you're just operating on instinct. So I think Jill is doing better than Jack. You know, you're absolutely right. Jill, who started at 27, started with nothing, learned that you've got to do what you've got to do until someone says yes. Jack, though, had the engineering skills, had the deep, deep technical knowledge, and had spent most of his backstory around getting a perfect product. And I'm going to end off, Bruce, with something that Jill said to me. I'm going to quote her. She said to me when I said, how do you get it right, Jill? She said, look, Pablo, it's very simple. Emerson said you can build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. I said, yes, of course he did. She said, well, I think you can build a better mousetrap, but the world won't beat a path to your door if your customers own cats. <laughs> yes, I think I get the point. There we go. Jill completely outplayed Jack every time. If you don't focus on customers and believe that you can build a business with better products and better materials and better manufacturing processes, you're building a mousetrap for people who own cats. And that was Jill's point. Pablo Vitides, Auric Business Accelerator. What lovely tales tonight and what wonderful illustrations of just the different levels of skill. And you think you're doing exactly the right thing. And you can't understand why nobody's buying this beautiful, great quality, awesome furniture. Well, if you're not telling them about it, how on earth are they ever going to know? Thank you, Pablo Fatidis from Auric Business Accelerator.